Good morning. So good to see all of you. Uh, I'm glad that you're here in the room. I'm glad that you're joining us online, wherever you're watching from. And I want to take just a quick moment. If it's your first time here at Christ Church, I'm so thankful that you carve some space out of your morning to come and be with us. I want to invite you to do me one solid favor today. If it is your first time, reach in the seat back in front of you. There is a communication, a connection card, and it just says welcome home at the top of it. And it would mean a lot if you would fill that out for me. That helps us be a good host of you to know who was here with us. And then uh, one even better next step for you is to take that. And then after service, if you'll bring that to me, I'm going to be by our patio space just through these double doors. I would love the chance just to meet you, get to know your name, introduce myself to you. It'd mean a lot to me. And so I hope that you'll do that so that we can just begin connecting. Maybe I can answer some questions for you, but just to begin building relationship together. Uh, a couple exciting things going on that I get to announce and keep in front of us. But today, first of all, you may have seen uh, quite the party out in the uh, foyer area, but today marks Christ Church's 31st birthday. And so we get to celebrate this morning. Absolutely. And what better way to celebrate than cupcakes? And so I hope that you'll stick around. There's going to be plenty of cupcakes. Eat some, talk with some friends, have some fun. Let's just continue to make some noise in the foyer with community afterwards. But uh, I spent some time just reflecting on really all that has happened uh, 31 years ago through uh, Dennis and Kathy Turner, um, they said yes to God asking them to take a massive next step. Uh, I was officially three years old when they would have said yes to that. And uh, it's uh, fairly odd to think about in that way. But um, what has struck me so much is that 31 years ago, today launched the beginning of uh, an incredibly fruitful ministry where God did the things that only God could do. And God started changing lives and transforming the hearts and lives of people from death to life 31 years ago. And fast forward to today, he's still doing the exact same thing through so many new faces and different people and, and some of the same people. But I'm just blown away at God's faithfulness. And so I'm very excited to celebrate today. I'm excited to look forward at the next season ahead, believing that God is going to continue to do the same things that only he could do and that only he does do. And so uh, I'm very excited about that. So just hang out, eat some, eat some food and, and uh, enjoy some fellowship afterwards. Uh, one other thing if you serve on one of our kingdom teams here, you've seen some of us repping this new shirt. Uh, if you serve on a kingdom team, tonight is our annual kingdom team night. It's a massive celebration that we put on every single year, just our way of loving on all of you who serve and take your next steps in making a difference in that way. We could not do what we do without all of our kingdom team members. And so there's gonna be a, a few hundred of us tonight. And I'm really excited about that. We're gonna have some delicious food and snacks. Uh, you'll get your shirt. This is the pre-release version. You get yours tonight. Uh, and if you don't serve on a kingdom team, then I really do wanna encourage you to go through growth track, take some next steps and become integrated into the life of the church in a deeper way way. You'll build meaningful relationship. You'll be able to begin making a difference in the ways that God has wired you to make a difference and serve. And next year you get a shirt. So anyway, it's definitely worth it, I promise. And then the last thing before we jump into the message is this is really important. And I want to invite all of you to mark your calendars on October 12th. That's a Saturday from 9 a.m. to 11:30 for Freedom Conversations. It's gathering that we're going to be hosting here at our East Campus. It'll focus on identity and unlocking your true self as you discover who it is that God desires and has called you to be. Uh, you'll have a great opportunity to build some relationships with others who are on the same path that you're on. And we've set aside some time for honest connection and some real conversation during this time. But I, I do want to emphasize this so much more than just 
a gathering. It's not an event to say, oh, I did that thing. It's, it's not simply a thing to put on your calendar to, to make sure that you represent your family. It's so much more than that. It is a deep and intentional opportunity to connect with others and understand and learn the identity that God has given to you. And so I want to encourage you to join us as we experience and explore what it means to live courageously in your divine purpose, your calling, and your identity that God has given you. So I hope you'll plan to take that next step. Register for that. Mark it on your calendar, October 12th, 9 a.m. to 1130 a.m. With that, I want to pray for us and dive right into the message this morning. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I love you and I thank you for the gift of gathering together. I thank you for the gift of 31 years of gathering together. God, you have been so good and so faithful. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives have been transformed by you. And that we get to be a part of that, Lord, thank you. And so I pray now in these next few moments that as we dive into your word, that you would begin to speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, would you empower us and embolden us to take a next step closer toward you today? And so we give you this time. We give you our minds and our focus, and we ask that you would speak in a powerful way. We love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. We are continuing in our message series this morning called Enough. This is week three. I think any time the church begins talking about money, it can get a little uncomfortable and uh, sometimes even for some of us frustrating. It can be frustrating, but I've shared this each week throughout this series. I'll continue to do this because I think it's very important. We see uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He's talking to Timothy, who's a young pastor, and he's saying, as you go, as you continue to lead people, you've got to teach these things. You've got to urge them in these things. It matters that we understand what God says about how we handle our money. So don't ever neglect to teach these things. And so I think it's too important of a conversation not to have for each one of us, because hear me well, what I want for you is not something that affects me it, it has some effect on the church, but what I want for you to experience is the things that I've experienced for God in our life by choosing to do it his way. I want you to experience what God has for you as it comes to engaging your personal finances. I want you to live with the abundance and the contentment and the freedom from strain that the world will always and exclusively enforce and so I want you to experience what God has for you. And the only way we do that is by doing it God's way. Today we're tackling another enough statement. And the statement is this, I will have enough. I will have enough. And we're specifically talking about tithing this morning. So everybody, you can let out your exhale. Maybe it's your inhale, but I encourage you to not hold your breath for the next 27 minutes. But... Last week, we talked about stewardship, and we talked about wisdom with our money. One of the most important truths that we've got to keep in front of us, we've got to bring this over from uh, last week into the message today, is that we can't ever forget that God is our only source of provision. He is our only pure source of provision. And the tithe, it's a precedent that's been set, something that I still believe that we are called to follow and walk in today. And I always wanna make sure that I say this, it's in no way to boast or brag in any way. As a matter of fact, I think it's uh, almost impossible to boast when we just do the bare minimum that God has asked us to live into. But I always wanna emphasize with full transparency that this is something that my wife and I practice and believe in. And I say that just to say that Church, I will never come before you and ask you to take a step into something that I don't believe in and that I don't personally practice. This has transformed our life. I've made this joke many times, but it's really not a joke. That's the punchline. It's not a joke. But uh, preaching has been one of the most 
uh, challenging and impactful things for my spiritual journey because I'll, I'll be in my office after our teaching team meets and we create these outlines and it's like, yeah, that's really good. And I'll sit down and I'll start writing the message. And every time the Lord just, it's like he's kind of just tapping me on the head. He goes, it's pretty good stuff in there, right? I'm like, yeah, can't wait till they all hear it. He goes, make sure you hear it first. And so hear me, each one of these messages, it hits me so hard before you ever get to hear it because my heart is to stand before you and know that I'm walking in everything that I ask you to walk into. And so whether it's a next step that we take, whether it's a, a practical level of obedience and following Jesus, I am walking my best to set the pace and to say, this is what it looks like. And I believe in it. And so I'm doing it as well. And so I, it's very important. I want you to know that my wife and I believe in this and we do this as well. We return a full tithe to the Lord through this church. And we're in a season now where we're walking out what it may look like to be a generous household and family, what it looks like for us to give above and beyond our tithe, which is what we're gonna talk about next week. But I do wanna emphasize and be really honest our journey into tithing was not a zero to 100 experience for us. It wasn't just that easy. And I don't think that it's probably gonna be that easy for many of you, and maybe it hasn't been as you've begun walking that journey. It was a time of testing for us. It was a time of testing where we had to decide, is God who he says he is? Will he really take care of us? Will he really be faithful if I say yes to this if I begin taking this next step. And that's really the heart of the big idea this morning. It's this, the purpose of testing is to increase our faith and reveal the truth. And so I'd encourage you to write that down this morning. The big idea is the purpose of testing is to increase our faith and reveal the truth. I wanna go ahead and get into our Bibles this morning. We're gonna go to Malachi chapter three. It's the very last book of the Old Testament, so you'll find it uh, hiding right behind Matthew. It's only a few pages long, so uh, don't turn a lot at once. But we're going to start in Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. From the days of your fathers, you've turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? So God had an unchanging love for the people of Israel. And I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, when I think about a people that have an unchanging God, a faithful God who has loved them and provided for all their needs, wouldn't that mean it's awfully easy to just do whatever he asks us to do? It seems like, that would be a very easy thing. However, that is literally not even close to how humanity handles following Jesus. We don't often operate with that sort of a boldness in obedience and faithfulness. We were born into a sinful nature because of the fall of man in the garden in the beginning of Genesis. And because of that nature, because of our nature that we've been born into, I completely lost my place. But because of that nature, it's always caused a challenge. It's always caused a moment where we ask the question, can I or do I or will I trust that God is my provision? He had this unchanging love. And what he's saying in verse eight, is he's saying, return to me. I want you to return to me. And verse eight uses some language that probably makes you pause a bit. I think it's good and right for us to do that. God's saying to the Israelite people, you are robbing me. He says, you are robbing me. And in truth, we read this, we've got to be and hear this very same truth back to us. It's very important that we don't miss this because God makes this statement and we equally have to pause and take account of where we're at with this. They responded the same way that we naturally would. Well, how in the world am I robbing you? How am I robbing you? He answers them. He says, well, you're doing it in your tithes and your contributions. And again, this should cause us 
to stop and process a couple different things here in this moment. I already mentioned we've, we've got to carry some truth over from the message last week, and it's important. We always have to keep the truth in front of us because the world is going to speak a different message, and so this is our truth. We've got to keep the truth right in front of us. So what's the truth? The truth is, again, God is our only source of provision. God is our only source of provision, and this is really important to talk through. There's two different kingdoms at play. There's the kingdom of the world, and then there's the kingdom of God. There's two different kingdoms at play. And the moment that you confess Jesus as Lord, you choose, you say, I'm gonna step out of this world and I'm gonna step into this one. I choose to follow after Jesus. You step out of the kingdom of the world and you are now defined and a citizen of the kingdom of God. It is something that happens. There is no way to be a follower of Jesus and exist and live in the kingdom of the world. It doesn't work that way. And so how many of us are followers of Jesus this morning? I suspect many of us in the room are followers of Jesus. And what that means is we are no longer citizens of the kingdom of the world. We don't operate as citizens of the kingdom of the world We've stepped into the kingdom of God. This is very important. In any kingdom, the king owns everything. In any kingdom, the king owns everything. But the tricky part with the kingdom of the world is it makes us feel like we all get a portion of kingship. I own a little bit. I at least own my own little thing. But isn't it funny how the kingdom of the world has processes and ways to forcibly take its portion out of what you own. And if we don't abide by them, if we don't pay our taxes, if we cheat on our taxes, if we whatever in our taxes, the things that the kingdom of the world says, no, no, you owe that to me. You bring that to me. We experience punishment from it. Friends, the king owns everything in the land and So we're not owners of this. We can't lie to ourselves. The kingdom of the world has done that far too long. But this morning, if you are a Christ follower, then you belong to the kingdom of God. And that means that everything you have belongs to the king. It's very important that we understand that. If you are a kingdom, if you live and exist in the kingdom of God, everything belongs to the king. And he promises He promises to provide for all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's what Philippians 4, 19 says. And if we belong to his kingdom and he is our provider, then everything belongs to him, even the things that he's entrusted to us. And so withholding what he's asked from us isn't simply just us being fearful, disobedient, stubborn. We've got to recognize it is us stealing from him. It is us robbing God. It's exactly what's being called out in this section of the text. And there's a very important question that we've got to ask and understand the answer to as it pertains to this. What's the purpose of the tithe? What's the purpose of the tithe? Because if it's true that God doesn't need our resources, He's got all this. He owns all the things. If he doesn't need our resources, then what's the point? Why am I asked to return the tithe? And I think it's important to point out this really isn't a conversation about dollars and cents. It's it's not a conversation about money at all. It's a conversation about our heart. It's a conversation about trust. It's a conversation about our devotion, the state of our soul, our relationship with God. Because if God has given you everything you have, everything that you have, everything that is in your possession, and he's asked you that you honor him with the first tenth of all that you gain, all that you receive, then we have to decide, do I trust God or not? Do I trust God or not? Because withholding something that's not ours to begin with, it points to an emphatic answer to that question. And it says, no, I don't trust you. That's what we are saying. It says, I don't trust you. 
I want to keep reading in the text. Let's look at verse 9 out of Malachi 3. It says, You're cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. It's a fairly strong chunk of words right there. And while I wish I could explain this and, and help minimize the, the, the weight and the severity of this, I, I can't do that. It's so important. This is the reality of what life is like outside of complete obedience to Christ. The, the curse is what the world has that binds us to itself. It's what holds us in this kingdom. The curse is the binding of the world. As long as we're doing it the world's way, then we are rejecting God's way. We're expressing our hatred towards him. Remember, we've talked about this. It's impossible to serve two masters because you will love one and you will reject the other. And so friends, if we walk around and our fists are clenched and we're holding on to my stuff, my stuff, my stuff, then it is that very nature that we have, the way that we're walking that is rejecting God's kingdom, his provision, him as our provider. And we are expressing our hatred towards him and we are being lovers of the kingdom of the world. Again, he's talking to the people as a whole, but Jesus came so that we would what? Have life and have it to the full, have it in abundance. And friends, it's only possible through him. It's only possible to experience this through him. So this is just the clear reality of us robbing God when we choose to hold on to that which he's given each of us to steward and to worship him with, to honor him with. It's as clear an invitation for us to return back to God's way. It's a very clear invitation. As we go on in verse 10, we see this clear instruction of the tithe. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. He doesn't say, Let, I'll pour down a blessing until you have no more wants. You'll just be drowning in your possessions. That's not what he's saying, until there is no more need. Now, hear me, God's provision is lavish. It is abundant. You will always have more than what you need. But we can't define the truth by the definitions of the world. It's all different when we're in God's kingdom. A tithe means a tenth. This is where 10% comes from. As we talk about returning the tithe, we return it because we don't own it, right? God's the source of our provision. So we don't give it to him, we return it to him. So what really is the ask? When we hear that we're to bring the full tithe into the storehouse, the ask is that we bring of the very first of our increase, we offer it back to the Lord. And it's an incredible act of worship when we do this. It's an act of worship, it's an act of devotion when we do this. It's us honoring the Lord with what we understand that he has given to us to steward. And we give him of the first, we give him of the best. We don't offer him what might be left. If we offered God what might be left, what would that look like for many of us? There ain't nothing left. Anybody ever got to the end of the paycheck and realized how much month there was left? We know what this feels like. And so if we say, well, if I have anything left, then I'll give to you. Boy, aren't we glad that he didn't provide for us in that way. He said, no, no, I'm gonna give you all that you need. I'm gonna give you far more that you need. Will you trust me with it? We've gotta be honest. For most of us, the answer is no. I won't, I, I don't know how to. I don't feel like I can trust you with it. Any relationship where we just offer leftovers is a relationship that is actively dying. That would never be good enough for me to come home and tell my wife, you know what, hey, babe, I don't have it tonight. I just don't have the energy to, to even care about you. She goes, well, why? First of all, offensive. 
Second of all, I'd have to explain to her, well, I've just been, I don't know, I've been taking care of everybody at church. I'm, I'm pouring into them and I, I just, too much. I, I don't have enough for you left. That's not good enough. That is never good enough. That's a relationship that is dying. Now, hear me well. Uh, full confession, I, I don't have this figured out. These are real life things that all of us wrestle with. We offer leftovers, but this is the power of first fruits. You get the first, you get the best. And friends, that is offered to the provider. He gets the first, he gets the best. And in full faith, we believe and trust that God is our provider and he is going to allow the 90% that remains to be more than enough to supply all that we need. The truth is I will have enough. Returning the tithe is such an incredibly deep expression of faith. It's placing action towards our devotion to God. Many of us in this room, most of us in this room, have such an incredibly deep devotion to the Lord if it were purely based on the words that come out of our mouth. We have such a deep devotion to the Lord if it were only based on the words that we spoke about God, about who he is, about who we are in him. But friends, if we paired our words with our actions, our devotion starts to disappear awfully quick. It disappears quick because it's so much more difficult to take steps than it is to speak words. Speaking is easy. I've heard so many times that in church especially, well, I wanna go, I wanna go deep. I wanna go deeper. Like we're, we're talking about these basic things. I wanna talk about big things. I wanna talk about deep things. Church, can I tell you that the, the deepest your faith can ever go is when you take the bare essentials of what God has given to you and you begin walking those steps. You will find yourself drowning in a sea of God's goodness, God's faithfulness, God's provision when you begin walking the steps that he has for you. We're not here to just get intellectually saved. We are here to have our entire being transformed into the likeness, into the image of Christ. And it means we've got to take these steps, these physical steps in obedience to him in every single way. Our founding pastor, he had a specific vision for this church. And I know he at least shared this 15 plus years ago. It may have been even longer before that. But he wanted to see 200 tithing families in this church. That was part of his vision. I just wanna see 200 families in this church say, I believe God's my provider. I'm standing on this promise and I will faithfully give and offer the first and the best to God for him to do what only he could do. And can I tell you that in our history, we've never even come close to that. We've never come close to that. This is a very generous guess, but based on the annual amounts of money given to this church, we couldn't even say that we have 65 tithing families in the church. We couldn't even say that we have 65. Out of an average attendance of 675 people a week, this is how many of us maybe are returning a tithe back to the church, back to the Lord and hear me again that's a generous guess and I only say that to say that our words don't match our next steps friends it's time that we begin taking the steps and we begin walking the same word that we speak that will transform everything for you if we stop talking, just simply talking about God's goodness and we start walking in God's goodness, it will change everything for you. It matters. Some of us are in, a, you know, we have a million different excuses why we are the way that we are, why we walk the steps that we walk. For some of us, we don't wanna let go of something that we still believe is ours. We believe that it's mine and I don't want to let go. Some of us are comfortable just coming in and I'm gonna receive, I'm gonna slip in, I'm gonna slip out, you won't even notice I'm there, which for the record is awful, I don't want that. 
I literally want to notice that you're here. Uh, That's why I invite you every week. I want to come meet you. I don't want you to ever walk in and walk out and miss out on all that God has for you, which is relationship, community, life together, transformation from the Holy Spirit. I want you to experience all of that. But many of us are are just comfortable. We go, well, no, I'm just going to come in and and then I'm going to leave and I'm just going to be in the background. Maybe that's your excuse. Maybe that's your reason. Some of us don't have our finances in a place where we can even imagine a possibility of returning the tithe back to the Lord. Maybe we even want to, and we just go, it's just not, it's really not in the cards for me. I don't know if you've seen my budget, but it's got a lot of red numbers on it. And so I, I can't even imagine that. We, could, we couldn't take that step, even if we wanted to. Friends, for any one of these I want to reemphasize, and I want to invite you again intentionally. Will you sign up for Financial Peace University? It is so practical, but I, I, I will help take out as a church family. We want to pay for all of it so that you don't have any excuses, any reasons why. But I want you to experience God's best in the area of your personal finances. I don't want you to walk around with that weight on your shoulders that many of us feel because you're so strapped, because you're doing it the world's way. This starts October 13th, next Sunday evening. It is super not too late to sign up. Go to our app, go to our website. It's gonna be from five to 6.30 on Sunday nights over the next nine weeks. And so sign up for that. Take that next step. It will help you get these things ironed out and take some next steps in your personal finance. But what's so important to see from this part of the text, this is the only place in all of scripture that God encourages us to put him to the test. It's the only place in all of scripture where God says, put me to the test. Do you think he's concerned that he won't come through? I sure don't. I've seen it time and time again. I've experienced it. I've lived it. I've walked it time and time again. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, it points to this very truth and promise. It says this, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, the first, the best. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. We begin to see in this Proverbs passage the promise that God makes us as we read on in the Malachi passage. So let's go back to that. Malachi 3, verse 11 and 12. It says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Friends, do you understand what God's promise is here? His absolute promise is that he will take you care of us. I will take care of you. And not just that. What does he say? He says, I will war on your behalf. I will fight for you. I will rebuke the devourer so that it won't destroy anything that you put your hands to in my name for my honor. I will war on your behalf. You'll never go without Everyone will see you. They'll call you blessed. They'll see the hand of God all over you and you'll be someone. You'll become the person that is infectious to all of the people around you. Friends, this is what happens when you put your trust in God when it comes to this area of your personal finances. It doesn't matter a lick of how much or how little you make whatsoever. Remember, contentment covers that part. When we come to a place where we're at peace, we're settled with where God has me today. Despite what I see around me, despite if somebody's winning, if somebody's losing, if I'm winning or if I'm losing, it doesn't matter. It's week one of the message. If you've missed any of them, go back and watch them. But if I I can become at peace, if I find contentment here, it'll cover this part of it. We've gotta become settled with where we're at right now, but God's promises are true. I can point to them in my own life. I have story after story after story of God providing for Lauren and I, despite our circumstances. We had, this was just a little over 10 years ago, 
and we wanted to go through FPU. Well, she wanted to go through FPU. I was a little bit dragging my feet, but I'm, I'm kind of an all in guy. And so she convinced me, I said, if we're doing it though, like, hey, we're, we're doing it. She's like, okay. And so we took this class and we were literally paycheck to paycheck. We, we didn't understand where the money was going. And combined, we, we made about $70,000 as a household. And so uh, we were certainly making ends meet, kind of, but we had nothing left. I mean, we, we couldn't afford to pay some of our bills sometimes. And we had to, you know, do the whole domino shuffle of bills and when I can pay this and all that. We didn't know where the money was going. And, and we had already taken one step in giving to the church. We were given a couple hundred bucks a month and, you know, walking around like, well, aren't you guys glad to have us around? We're really keeping this place afloat. Fast forward, that church closed down, by the way. It's a plot twist I bet you didn't see coming. But we decided we're gonna start this. We had about $19,000 in debt. And we did our first budget and it's like, well, the math doesn't add up the way that we've experienced it. But let's start, let's, we're, gonna, we're gonna start tithing for the first time. It was horrifying for us. It's like, I don't understand how this is gonna work. It's never worked and we haven't given this much. So we're gonna start tithing. And over the next nine months, we started for the first time, we were going through Financial Peace University on our same income that we had been barely surviving on, we paid off every single dime of our debt in nine months. And, and hear me, it's not, it's just God's faithfulness. This is what happens when we do it God's way. We didn't have some special sauce. We just decided I'm, I'm done doing it my way. It's not working, it's not gonna work. And so I'm, I'm gonna lock in and we're gonna do this different. And through us placing God first, he gets our first, he gets our best because that's what he deserves. He has cared for our every need in abundance. And it's been over 10 years, we've never missed an opportunity every single month to return our tithe back to the church because I believe in it. It is God's faithfulness. And friends, can I tell you that you can begin experiencing it today. You can begin experiencing it if you'll take that next step. God's promises are true. In the very beginning of the Malachi text, God calls for us to repent. He calls for us to turn back to him. And this morning, I, I wanna pause and I wanna give us an opportunity to do just that. We don't do this often. This is a little different for us, but it's so important. I wanna lead us in a prayer of repentance. And if you're out of place this morning where you're ready to take a next step, to begin your journey towards obedience, when it comes to your personal finances, when it comes to returning the tithe, I wanna ask you to just simply pray along in your heart this prayer of repentance. And so I wanna invite all of us to just close our eyes and bow our heads and say this prayer with me if you're ready to take a next step this morning. God, I confess that I've believed that I am my own provider. I've believed that what you asked me to steward was actually mine. I repent of that belief. You are my provider. You are my source. I believe that your promise to care for me is true. I desire to honor you with all that you bless me with. Today, I turn myself back to you. Amen. Every time we engage with God's word, it leads us to take a next step. I believe that. So I wanna invite all of you to reach this seat back in front of you. Grab a next step card. It's just a blank card that says next step at the top. And I want you to write this down. It's a question that I want you to take before the Lord and wrestle through. How am I going to take a step towards returning 
the tithe. I don't know what your journey with giving has been. Maybe you've never given and your first next step is that I'm just gonna give. I'm gonna give once and I'm gonna see, will I be okay? Will God take care of me? Will he be faithful as he's promised to? Maybe that's your next step. Maybe you've given occasionally and your next step is to trust God on a consistent basis. I'm going to become a recurring giver. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give you my first, my best. I don't know that I'm there yet. I'm I'm fearful, but I'm gonna begin my journey of testing you in this. Maybe you've been doing that. Maybe you need to step into becoming a percentage giver. I'm, I'm gonna pick a percentage, one that makes me feel like I actually take a next step of faith and trust. And I'm just gonna become consistent with that. I'm gonna walk my journey towards obedience in returning the tithe. Maybe you've already been tithing and you are already experiencing God's faithfulness. Maybe ask the Lord, what does our journey into generosity look like? We're gonna talk about that more next week. But I want you to take this next step, take this before the Lord and my ask is that you'd simply be obedient. Let's pray. Father God, we ask you that you would just speak to us so clearly. Give us wisdom, give us next steps, give us direction, and give us the boldness to take them. Lord, may we experience your faithfulness in this area of money and finance as we return what has never belonged to us, and we offer it to you faithfully. Lord, we pray this in your name, amen. I wanna invite you to stand up. Our team's gonna lead us in one last song, and we have an opportunity to respond every week. Our prayer team's gonna be available. If you wanna come down front and receive prayer, then I invite you to do just that. But if you wanna respond in your seat, I encourage you to do that as well. But as the team leads us in this last song, let's respond in worship.